We're going to bring on Drew Gibson back to tour life because this guy decides to show up to USDGC Monday qualifies, not only playing great in the Monday qualifier, but finds himself on the lead card the very next day of the tournament. Drew, how's it going, brother? Hey, man. How are you? I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, you uh, fine gentlemen. Yes, uh, we're doing good. We're doing good. Excited to talk to you first. Congrats on the baby announcement. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You and Yuli, uh, I'm sure, uh, can be talking back and forth about having a newborn on the way. I'm sure it's, uh, I don't know anything about that, but you guys I'm sure can talk about that. Uh, <laughs> off, uh, off. I, feel, I feel like you're just preparing yourself for the biggest mess you've ever seen every day and hoping that that doesn't come through is what I've been preparing. My, that's what I've been telling myself is that I'm just going to be poop and throw up everywhere. And if it's any better than that, I'll be happy. See, I can't, I, it's going to be interesting because I don't, I don't know how I'm going to handle that because I'm terrible at seeing other people's injuries. Like there were some major injuries in the NFL this week and I just, I can't watch any of them. Like I just have a hard time watching it, but if it's my injury, I have no problem watching it. And I'm hoping that is the same for like my kids. Cause like I probably don't do that great around vomit and feces of other people, but I'm hoping if it's my child that it doesn't like affect me and I'm able to just go in there. No problem. I think that's I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't want to wipe Paul's butt, but I think, <laughs> you know, I think my baby, it might be a little different. So yeah, I, I don't think you guys are out of the norm here. I think everybody thinks the same way. Everybody's stuff is, is gross, but when it's your kid, it, it's, it's it, a little bit it's different. Fine. Yeah. It's okay. Fine. Um, yeah, Drew, I guess first off, kind of tell us like how the season was this year, um, expectations coming into the season, uh, where you're at, uh, with how you end up finishing and all that. Uh, I mean, going into the season, I didn't expect all that much. I mean, after preserve last year, I dropped out, uh, after I believe the third round, uh, came home, had some stuff, uh, with my arm, wasn't really able to practice how I think you would need to practice if you want to like compete at the level at least I was competing at on the pro tour prior to being injured. Um, so I kind of went into the season, obviously hoping for the best, but uh, Waco after the first round, I was literally in dead last place. I was the person that teed off after Kristen Tatar and MPO. So that, uh, that wasn't good, but um, overall, I mean, I won the Q series event in Kansas city, which is now going to be an elite series event. So hopefully, um, you know, be able to go there and play on lead card, at least for the first round um, as returning champion. And then overall, I think finishing the year um, with a top 10 finish. And as you mentioned, Monday qualifying at USADC, um, was a high note. Um, by no means was this a season that I think anyone, you know, I'm going to tell my kid about, hopefully they don't know how to use Google for a long time. Um, but overall I would say there were some, some high notes and obviously plenty of, uh, low ones to talk about, but I think that comes with being a aging athlete. Um, I know, I mean, Yuli and I've had these conversations before where he's had seasons that, you know, didn't go his way or whatever. And I think that that's just kind of part of, being older, being injured, um, maybe having to focus on business things or other things that are arising and not being able to put, uh, everything you need to put into beating Gannon every week. Yeah. What about no like, uh, so you go Monday qualify USDGC. What are those plans? Like, like, do you just do a one way ticket in and you're like, no, I got this. Like I'm going to be playing in the tournament or, or do you have a, a round trip booked for that Tuesday coming home? Oh, I was flying out at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when you when you play on tour for as long as I have, and then you play as many tour events as I did where you can qualify, you don't think that magically Monday you're just going to slip in. Like, obviously, I played, I've had a pretty good track record at that tournament, and I've been winning it, you know, I think like four or five times at some point during the event. I've made lead card a bunch of times, had a bunch of good finishes. So I thought that if there was a place I could go Monday qualify and perform would be there, but I definitely had a Tuesday morning flight, flight home booked. <laughs> what was the, uh, what was like the, the card mates? Like who were you playing with? Were other people like close to making it in? Or? No, by the time we made it to like, kind of the crunch time of the round, like after 13, 14 area, I think everyone in my group was like decently over par. So um, are they just like any... rooting you on? Like, how does that work in a qualifier? Or is... and where's your mind at? Like, are you, are you, is this, was this a stressful round for you or was it like a, Oh, la di da, you know, um, Monday I mean, morning. Mixture of, mixture of both. I think that my season, I mean, after last year, 2023 being 
hurt and not getting to finish the season. Um, and then going into 2024 and just having, I mean, really lackluster play after lackluster play. I, I didn't go into that Monday qualifier with any chip on my shoulder. I just said, Hey, if I throw the disc and bounds and I make my putts, I don't, I don't think there's five other people in this event that are going to play better than me. Um, so I had that going for me in the sense of, you know, other than Grady, I was a highest rated person. Um, so it was like, if I just, if we all just play to what our rating is at this moment, I, I'll make it in. Um, and I was just trying to minimize mistakes. I think I was seven under through, I want to say 11, uh, which is obviously a great ground at that course. And I literally just told my caddy, Ben, Hey, let's just par out. I accidentally birdied hole 14. I parked it. Um, and then from there, I just, again, tried to just make as many pars as I could. Um, but as for being nervous, I, again, I went there with like, of course, wanting to make it in. If I didn't want to play, I wouldn't have went. Um, you know, but I wasn't, I didn't start whole one nervous or with a bunch of expectations. I just wanted to play and, uh, you know, earn my way into that event. I've always been a big proponent of if you tour and you don't make it into the USDGC, you frankly don't deserve to be there. So part of my decision to fly across the country, um, and go try to qualify was just to prove to myself more than anyone else or anything else that, uh, I still, you know, deserve to be there. And, I earned the right to play there, whether I did it on Monday or did it at the first event of the year. Um, I've always been a big proponent of like, if you're a touring player, you don't get in USCGC, then there's, there's something wrong. Yeah. Well, I think, I think now we're going to see more, you know, back, back when I first started playing, there weren't that many big names. I would say that were like trying to qualify into USCGC. I think we're going to see more and more like recognizable names. Cause it's just going to get harder and harder to get into USCGC. Um, with as many people that are touring. Cause that's really what it was, right? Like a few years ago, you would show up to a tournament and be like, Oh, if I get like 50th place, I'll get a USCGC. Cause everyone in front of, uh, in front of there is already qualified. Well, I mean, that's what happened at green mountain championship. I, I had to come home because we had appointments for the baby and I wasn't going to miss that. Um, and I knew that that would put me in a situation where I had to money qualify, but Tristan Tanner, um, you know, got in the tournament in 64th place at Green Mountain Championship. Like, I'm pretty confident if I would have showed up to that event, um, I would have, you know, gotten hopefully 64th or <laughs> better um, and would have made it in. And he got the first qualifying spot at 64th place. Yeah. So, you know, I prioritized my family and, you know, new baby we have coming. And that was this decision I was fine with making is knowing I was going to miss both of those qualifying opportunities. But, you know, again, it comes down to, you know, he was the last person again, and he was the first person to drop out of the tournament. So at some point, you know, yeah, he, he was a second. Event, I was the first person to drop out of the tournament. Well, actually. you weren't 17 over when you dropped out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, like I said, I just feel like the people that want to be there and, you know, earn their way being there on the course, you know, and, and doing it in a way where they earned it. I mean, years prior, I always would have qualified Memorial or Vegas every year for like five or six years in a row. Um, one of those being I won Vegas, but I always took pride in like being in the USCGC, you know, in f February, I always thought that that was awesome. Um, so this year was definitely a different change of pace, but I don't, like you just mentioned, I think that you are going to see a lot of top players without sponsorships, without being in USCGC, without touring. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of changes coming in the next, you know, eight to 12 months that we're all going to be pretty surprised by. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be interesting to see kind of what the state. I feel like we're in a, a stabilizing uh, the sport right now. It needs to figure out where it needs to stabilize, and that's what you know is going to you know big changes probably to come. But it'll hopefully be stable after that. Um, someone posed the question. They're curious. Would you ever uh, be a consultant or be interested in working with the tour when it comes to course design? Because you're, you're. I have. I've talk to Phil for hours upon hours. I've not going to say I've like forced my way in, but I've tried to beg, like, Hey, I'll go, you know, Monday morning and walk and, you know, try to do what I can. And I think sadly, it, it not sadly, because without the local committees, you wouldn't have tournaments, but I think it just relies on the tournaments to get it prepared. And their view is by the time Monday rolls around or whatever, it's, it's far too late for us to uh, improve the course for lack of better term. So um, I would love to do that. I, I hopefully maybe one day when I retire, um, that'll be something I can do is go to those events a couple weeks early, make sure the tee pads are level, make sure we're not filming off the middle of a bridge, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, as of now, I mean, the pro tour is still granting, uh, you know, waivers and such for those type of things, which I, I personally think are inexcusable. And if I was there the week before, I'd say, Hey, we at least need turf. We need something here. So we're not playing one of our elite plus events on four different surfaces, but 
where the sport's at. I, I mean, I don't think that there's really space for that consultant position or would it be helpful if, you know, the local community said, well, we can't do anything because it's already Monday. Yeah. Uh, we d- you mentioned this a little bit ago about the contracts and there are actually 80 players right now that have their contracts ending at the end of this year. Um, so hey. w- what do you think happens with all these expiring contracts? Uh, I mean, I, my, my personal opinion, and I, I hope I'm wrong for the strength of the field and the sport, but I think if you're not one of the big dogs or big producers, whether it's on social media, whether it's, uh, you know, you host a, some type of show or you're in charge of something, I, I think that we're going to see a lot of people uh, making some posts of, hey, I, I can't tour. I mean, I made a YouTube video last week about how much it cost me to Monday qualify, then stay for the 10 days. I got 10th place in the tournament and lost $1,300. So, I mean, that's not really sustainable for anybody to to go get 10th at a major. And I, I honestly feel like I played pretty well. I mean, of course, I could have played better. Um, and if you win, you get 30000 But I got 10th place, um, and you know, I lost 1300 bucks. So I think there's going to be people who aren't getting that monthly salary or selling bags or making YouTube revenue or, you know, whatever the extracurriculars might be. And they are, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of people who might be in a position where they have to decide, um, if it's even equitable to continue to play. Cause I know it's already, I mean, we all know there's plenty of people staying in their van or RV or whatever in the course parking lot, you know, kind of, trying to make it to the next thing. But that USDC would really made me realize like, okay, I came here. I, obviously I flew. I live across the country. I'm Monday qualified. Uh, you know, and I paid my own entry fee cause I, I don't have a company that pays my entry fees. So that was between the Monday qualifier and the tournament. That was $450. Uh, you know, and then, did you stay at the Ridge Carlton or what, man? What the? <laughs> oh, you stay for I'm any just... hotel for 10 days. <laughs> I know. You know, it's so it just gets, it just adds up. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you get 1700 for 10th place. It's like, even if you don't stay any, you, if you live, stay in your car, you're still not actually like making money. I, mean, yeah. I was there for 10 days. If you times your practice and your effort and your energy times 10 days for 1700 bucks, it's not really like a, very equitable investment. And so my point is, I think with these contracts, um, I think that these, you know, just say three to $7,000 a month kind of deals that were getting handed out a little easier during COVID or shortly after are going to start going from to one to two or 3000. All of a sudden touring and all that becomes a lot less uh, reachable. I think for a lot of people, yeah. well, you're, you're one Good of the idea. people who you go on tour and you do all the extra stuff, right? You're making your YouTube channel or your YouTube videos and everything. And obviously that pays a little bit. Like you go into the USDGC and they're making the YouTube video about how much it costs. People watch that and you get a little money back. Are you surprised that more people don't do it? Um, and is that tough? Is it hard to like have that sort of grind, go out there, do all the small stuff and do the YouTube or do you find it pretty easy? Um, I think it depends on what style. I think like the, the style that like, Brody and I had done for a while where you're doing the course and, you know, I don't know Brody's situation, but I edit it myself, you know, and I obviously try to make it look good because it needs to look good or else people are going to roast you in the comments. And I think that if you're doing a hour long video and you have to sit there and clip it and zoom in on all the shots and all that, it becomes very tedious. And um, obviously the return, you know, on a video like that 30 minute video, getting 50,000 views of course is there. Um, you know, but I, I always wonder why there were those people that, are you know borderline you know uh pros i guess you could say where you know that they're not cashing a bunch they're not their sponsors probably not giving them 10 grand a month why they're not using a little bit of their extra time to grind on the videos but as someone that does i also understand like if your goal is to be the number one player in the world you're not going to be grinding on the videos like i strongly believe that i mean simon i from my knowledge is about the only person that's you know, one, a pretty good amount of times in the last, just say five years and also films edits and like does all his own videos. Well, there's also, um, there's a lot of people that are just bad on camera. Yeah, no, um, I mean, there's a lot, obviously, I mean, my realization too, is, I mean, I ended up buying a pretty nice camera. Then you get $400 wireless mics. And before you know it, I've paid 3,500 bucks for my camera setup, which of course you don't need that, but that helps people. If they find your channel for the first time, they're going to subscribe or enjoy the content because they can hear you and they can see where the disc is going. Um, so to even create YouTube content, that's going to get people engaged and get those subscribers to get the money, you know, you have to invest in it. I think very few people, um, I use my phone. 
Yeah. And yeah. you're one of those popular people in disc golf. So people are going to watch you if you film it with this watermelon can. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't, you know, that's not like, I think that you're one of the outliers that, you know, can film it on your phone, edit it on your phone and people still live and die for your content. Um, I think that mid-level pro who has 2000 Instagram followers, it's going to be really hard for them to grow their YouTube channel with an iPhone and, you know, expect people who are watching my videos, Brody's videos, Simon's videos, Ezra's videos um, are pretty high quality to think, oh, I'm going to give this person my 30 minutes versus these other options that are already yeah. out there. When it, yeah, again, it goes sense. back to the fact of like, there are just people that are more entertaining than others. And well, that, I mean, that's why that, the Danza, I mean, we've seen skill. what he's done. You know, he is, you know, sub thousand rated. Um, you know, but he creates great, every time I watch one of his videos, I'm like, man, if I could edit like this, I have a million subscribers. You know, he's just very good at telling a story and putting himself in front of the camera. And, you know, maybe some people might not like the, the content or whatever, but at the end of the day, he's really good at what he does. But that makes why, you know, when he was 800 rated, why people liked watching him and he grew a following because he had nice equipment. You could hear him. He knew how to edit. Um, you know, and so I think that this is one of those sports where, I mean, just like Brody has kind of proved with his other ventures. I mean, ultimate to trick shots to golf to people follow him because he's good at what he does and able to present a product and be entertaining and be, people are interested. Um, I feel like someone in disc golf with 2000 followers, it's hard to even get the people interested because there's, you only have a small pool to really pull from to start your um, channel. If that makes any sense. No, it's, it's, that's a good point. I mean, the, with disc golf, if you're going only in disc golf, you're basically what you're saying is, is right you're having to pull people's attention away from other areas uh because there are so many people doing it now when i first got into disc golf there was almost no one doing social media almost no one and now it's almost like everyone's doing it now so it's way harder to kind of get your foot in the door if you will because like you said everyone's kind of already like well i watch this i do this i watch that and now you're trying to get people to go away from you. You have to kind of go outside the box and do something different. Um, I do want to say a little bit. I saw something about MTV Cribs. Do you guys remember that show? Yeah. I thought this was actually very fascinating. So almost the entirety of that show is fake. A lot of the houses they're showing, they actually don't even live in the house or they're leasing or it's someone else's house. Um, they were saying like the 50 cent one where he was showing all the cars that he had, those were all rentals. It was very much a look at how crazy a lifestyle these people have when in fact they really didn't. And the kind of documentary about it was basically saying, I'm sorry, I'm ruining it for a lot of people. Uh, this is me telling you that Santa isn't real. Don't have your kids watch this. Um, but the 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 reason for a lot of that is or at least what this guy's theory was was you need to have all these people trying to exp aspire to be a huge movie star or musical artist because those people end up feeding into that industry and they need those people they need those people to feed into the industry and if you have the lifestyle of I think they were saying like Jojo Jojo at this time was like living with their mom out of their car from like, uh, from like a hotel to hotel. Right. If you show that lifestyle, it's not really a one that people are going to look at and be like, I want that to be me. Right. And I think that is maybe an issue a little bit with disc golf is right now. <laughs> there are a lot of people and living in your van and traveling around the world. And that is hitting a very small minority of people that want that lifestyle. Do we see that being an issue? And is that something that's even fixable or is there things that we can do to fix that? Cause it's not a very luxurious lifestyle. It's not one that people are going to look at and be like, I want that. I get it. There's gonna be some people in the comments being like, I would love to do that. I'm talking about the grand scheme of things. It's not a super luxurious lifestyle. I mean, I think that the, it, it's a tough sale. I mean, like I said, I toured with Paul. We lived in his Kia and we went hotel to hotel. Um, I've lived in an RV. I mean, I've done it every way you could think of. And at the end of the day, I think it boils down to my experience at USCGC in order to 
get there, get in the tournament, do all that. You know, you, you were playing professional sport at the highest level and getting 10th place, which like I said, I'm proud of. If you told me every year you play USC this year, you're going to get 10th. I'd be like, Hey, that's a good career in itself. Um, you know, when you go there and you lose funds, I think that that's a, a deterrent. People want their kids to play baseball and soccer and basketball and these sports, because as you mentioned, you know, you're seeing Shoei Otani sign three, $400 million contracts and hit dingers on, you know, ESPN. And it's like, what parent wouldn't want that for their kids, you know? And, and there's granted, there's kids like Gannon who are making, you know, more than CEOs of companies, he's making a lot uh, of money, you know, yeah. succeeding. And he's 19 years old and doesn't have a house, doesn't have a car, doesn't have a driver's license, you know, like he's living the life. I don't know where all this is going. Hopefully he's investing in an Apple stock or something, but overall, I mean, there's two sides of the coin here. You know, there's a group of people that are making a lot, you know, and succeeding a lot and selling a lot of product. And then there's a group of people which is much bigger that I think, you know, are more in that MTV Cribs kind of category of, oh, I'm a professional athlete. You know, I'm going here, I'm going there, but it's, you know, they're, you know, cooking quesadilla in their, in their van or whatever it might be. And like I said, I'm saying this is someone where when I went on tour, I remember first tournament ever, Uliberry, I fly there with him. I think Geisinger maybe won the A tier and got like $680. And I literally told Paul, I said, how the heck do you do this? I'm like, he just won the eight year we played and he got 600 bucks. And he's like, oh man, it's a grind. You know, and now we're seeing like that same eight year now probably pays two or three grand. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're seeing, like I've been there. Paul for sure has been there since like you win a tournament or you do something and you, you theoretically get nothing. You did it. We did it because we loved the game and it was easier than working at Target. Uh, it, you know, that's like always my joke. People are like, well, why do people tour if they're, you know, the 80th person guy? It's like, well, if you make 30 grand, it's better than making 30 grand at Target. You know, at least you're out traveling the country, you know, hanging with your friends, playing practice rounds. Like, but I remember getting in the car and, you know, the award ceremony at Minnesota Majestic. And I literally looked at Paul, I'm like, dude, how do you do this? And he just laughed and said, buddy, it's a grind. And, you know, sadly for most people that, that hasn't, uh, changed much i mean brody i'd love to see your uh schematics on how much you've invested into the sport versus like what you brought back on the course wise not obviously sponsorship and all that like mm. you know obviously you dedicated your life to this game for the last three or four years um traveling i'm at see you every tournament doing all the stuff you know and it's like even when you play well it doesn't make up for the weeks you didn't you know if you're on the pga tour and you you know miss nine cuts in a row then you get eighth it's like oh crap okay i just got 1.6 million i i could go home and do nothing the rest of the year and have a just fine year you know to where us it's you miss nine cuts in a row then you get eighth you're like okay cool now now i can you know maybe go to buy some organic food instead of mcdonald's tonight yeah no it is tough i mean it is it is getting it's getting better. And again, it's one of those where I do think it needs to be top heavy and it, it, I, we can't be trying to, you know, have all these people on tour make a living. Uh, it does need to be a little bit cutthroat and top heavy because that's what's just going to produce the more uh, talent. It really is. It's going to make people hungrier. It's going to, you know, survival of the fittest. If you're not good, you're cut and you got to get better. And uh, so I think it is, it is what it is, but, um, the MTV yeah, no, cards thing is, is funny. And one, one thing I will say about that is, uh, like when you go into a job interview, I don't know where I'm going with this, but when you go into a job interview, you're going to dress up, right? That's not you. Like you're dressing up to be like, Hey, I'm professional today. I really want this job. It's the only suit you have. You get what I mean? One thing that I've done my whole career is I, I think it, it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way for a long time is I always just carried myself like I was an athlete and I was the best out there. You know what I mean? And, and there's something to that. I think what I see on tour with a lot of people is I see doubt, a lot of doubt and they go to each tournament and they grind it out and they're doing, they're doing the thing, but there's no belief behind it. And from coming from a place like, like Drew said, where, where I'm like, no, it's a grind. Like, no, what it was, it's more of a lifestyle of like, I'm here for the love of competition. You know what I mean? And you see, I was having an argument with somebody the other night and they were asking if I would trade a world championship for a million bucks. And I said, yeah, absolutely. 100%. They were like, well, what about for all the money in your bank account? I said, yes. And they're like, they couldn't understand why. 
And in sports, you see across the board, no matter where you're going to see these fairy tale stories of somebody like I just watched a thing on Instagram with the Lions kicker being like, hey, I was I was a bricklayer yeah. 18 months ago mm-hmm. and now I'm kicking winning field goals in the NFL. Like there's always going to be st- those stories across the board. There's always a level of I'm grinding, I'm grinding. Okay. I made it type thing. UFC is a big part of that too. And I don't think it's ever going to change. Like there's always going to be those outliers of barely making any money and trying to grind and, and get on the tour. The problem is in our sport is the top 20 guys. If you're not top 15 in the world, you're not making any money. Like Drew said, he took 10th place at the USDGC lost $1,300. Like that's not very lucrative. You know what I mean? The top guys making a bunch of money, but in, is, is that like the change that we need? Does the whole entire purse need to be crazy good in order for everybody to be successful? Or is it just like fine to be the top guy? You deserve it. You win, you win all the tournaments. You're fine. I think that my, my opinion on this is that, with what happens with these contracts this off season, I sadly believe, and I was telling someone else this today, um, that I hate to say it, but I think that there's going to be a lot of those people that, that are that mid level could, could get top five, top 10, maybe even win the event. Um, but typically you're in that, you know, 50 to 25 range where you're getting, you know, maybe your money back for the week after, you know, expenses and stuff. Those people are going to have to decide that they simply can't do it anymore because at the rate that, hotels, gas, food, everything else is going up. I mean, everyone who lives in our country knows that that's the truth. The the purses aren't going up at the same rate yeah. in that 50 to 25 range. Um, you know, and so those people, if they want a family or kids, or at some point, you know, you're not a 20 year old kid anymore and say, well, screw it. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to get in my car and go to the next tournament. Um, I think those people, these contracts, obviously, as it seems to me by the market um are going to go down I, I just simply think that they can't make it i mean no, yeah. no one should like become homeless or you know eat water for dinner in order to play disc golf and i sadly think that like if the sport goes the way it's going when it comes to these contracts I mean, i was at music city open this year and someone told me about one of the big manufacturers sending out a mass email saying hey expect cuts at the end of the year and send it to everybody like there wasn't someone excluded from that email um, you know, and so it's like, if that's where we're at and that's what the market is, uh, I guess showing that like, I think that those bottom, like I mentioned before, those three to five, seven thousand dollar people are now one to three thousand dollar people. And yeah, I simply don't think you can make yeah. it from event to event on that. Um, and I think that that hurts the sport in the sense of, cause I agree with Brody, especially when I was at the top every week, I definitely thought, man, I got freaking sixth place. Why did I not get five grand? You know, it should be higher up. And I still think that way. I just think that there needs to be some type of way um, to facilitate those, those people who still played well. Like I said, I think now 15th place is great. I mean, I think if you get 15th place, you're pretty much on top three cards, the whole event. Um, you're, you're beating great players. Like I, I think that should be awarded rewarded with more than a uh, thousand bucks here or there, in my opinion. And I think that that's for the sustainability of the sport, and less for like, hey, I get fifteenth and I I want more money. Um, you know, I think if you want more money, you need to sell more discs or make more videos or you know, in disc golf, like it's not like you're chasing this you know hundred million dollar deal unless you're maybe Gannon or AB or some of these young kids that are absolutely killing it. But I just I have a tough time believing that there's many people uh, chasing the dream. Once the people who are already barely making it possibly get uh, even deeper pay cut, if that makes sense. Well, it was, e- it was easier to chase the dream back in the day. And I, like people don't understand that. Like it was so much easier. You know why? Cause entry fees were 75 bucks. Like Dude, 75 I- bucks was fine. I can go to a tournament play for 75 bucks. I get 400 bucks. That's a lot of money. But, that's a lot of money. Now it's like 10 grand for a tour card. Yeah. You but can't that's pay be- that before you go on tour for a but lot that's of these why people. Our purses are higher. That's what a lot of people, yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that guys uh, at the end of the day, disc golf is a bunch of guys showing up, taking money out of their pockets, throwing it into the pile. And then there's one person that's, you know what? I'm not playing, but you know, I want to make this a little bit more interesting and they're matching the money. That is what disc golf is. I I think a lot of people just don't realize that, but at the end of the day, it's all of us just showing up to one of our buddy's house and we're playing poker and it's all of our money. 
that that is what it is. Like, and Gannon want, has twenty five full houses every. <laughs> if, if you want, and Gannon has the card in his pocket. <laughs> we can go back. We can go back to seventy five dollar entry fees. But you know what? No one's winning fifteen thousand no. dollars anymore. Here's, the winner, the winner is going to be taking home eight thousand. Here's like my that's, problem. That's just what's going to happen. It's it's all of our money that's making the tour purses higher. That's just what it is. If I have a problem with this like conversation, it's simply this. It's that, like I said, I pay my entry fees. I paid eighty dollars to pay, play the Monday qualifier, which of course they put that money into the purse. I'm not complaining about the eighty bucks. But then they sent me a thing of, oh hey, pay your invoice. I owed three hundred and seventy five more dollars. So I, I paid four hundred and fifty bucks, whatever, to theoretically play the USCGC. And then you tell me I get tenth and I get seventeen hundred dollars. It's like, well, what kind of what just happened? It's like, how, how is this like, like you just <laughs> yeah. said, we're, we're, we're paying the money in. And I think that the reason they're getting away with this is because, you know, a lot of these players and a lot of the companies pay the entry fees. So the pro tour says, screw it. Well, the Discraft's going to pay your $10,000 tour card. You don't have, who cares? So they just keep raising it and raising it. And the purse inherently goes up because it has to, but it's just like the tour card thing. Like in my opinion, I've said this before, so I have no problem saying this on a public thing. We pay a thousand plus dollars for a table of Costco snacks and a parking spot. Like, what is what do I don't feel like I get a tour card value from anything? Like, I'm already playing the tournament. I already paid my two hundred yeah, three hundred dollar entry fee. There's a lot of money being spent incorrectly. And so for me, yeah. it's like I am like a you know small time racing team pretty much in like a NASCAR. Like I'm paying for everything on my own. She so charged me a thousand dollars to park in the parking lot when I'm already parking further than the media crew and everybody else, it like, doesn't make sense to me. It's like, you're charging me the person a thousand dollars to, to park at the tournament. I already paid to play and already paid to travel to. And now you're pretty much charging me for a parking spot and some like granola bars. Like, I think that that's like the biggest problem, but 99% of the people that pay for a tour card, Discraft or Innova or whoever reimburses them. And so they don't care. They go, oh, yeah, cool. I'll charge nine grand. I'll just, Tell, you know, Bob to send me a check next week. It doesn't matter. But like the problem with me is that I don't, I, I could easily just sign up for these tournaments, not get a tour card. And maybe I have to park in BFE and take a shuttle or whatever, like the spectators. But at the end of the day, like a thousand bucks for a parking spot is like kind of insane to me. And I, I feel like, I mean, maybe you guys can elaborate more on what you feel like you get, but that's what I feel like we get from that. And Seth isn't even at these tournaments anymore. If you're someone, I know Brody, you use disc golf strong. I think you do Yuli as well. It's like, he's not even there. So now there's just a Zuka cart full of toys that you got to do yourself and you're still paying a thousand bucks. It's like, I don't know. I just, that's part of the problem in my opinion. And maybe I'm being like slightly harsh, but like, Oh, the sponsors will pay it. We'll just charge them a thousand bucks. It's like, well, I don't view it that way because I don't have a sponsor that pays it. And now you're charging me a thousand bucks for a parking spot. Yeah. I, I want to talk on that, but before I want to finish with the money thing too, which is the reason why the payouts are kind of wild right now is if, if we go back to the analogy of all of us playing poker, right? All 10, all 10 of us, let's say we have 10 guys sitting around. We're all playing poker. We all throw $5 in. Okay. We, we have a pot of 50 bucks, right? We need to start figuring out how to break that pot up. Now, if we pay all the way out to fifth place, so that whoever gets 50th or 50, 50%, right? Fifth place, let's say they get their money back. Well, now we're down to 45. Okay, fourth place, they get, let's say they get 10 bucks. Well, now we're down to 35. Third place, they get 15 bucks. We're now we're down to 20. We, we're running out of money. And so you make it to where like first place is like barely getting anything. And so what you have to do, and that's what you're basically saying right now is when the purses get massive, right? If we had massive amount of purses versus the entry fees, then you can make it set up to where first place still gets a crazy amount of money and it doesn't hurt that far down. But when the entry fee is very close to what the purses is, that's where it's like at a certain point, it's like, well, we want first place to actually win money. So we got to figure out where the break even point is. And right now the break even point, like you said, is not even 10th place, right? As far as all the other um, expenses that you had to pay for. You know, hotel, food, travel, if you're, if all you're that. Just, if you're not living in your car, you're not traveling in a Sprinter van, 
you know, and, and you fly into this tournament and you, you know, you stay where you, you know, hotel. Yeah. And I think that you're using the word purse when it's entry fee and added cash for yeah, a total purse. And that's what I'm saying right now, yeah. the entry fee and added cash, AK like sponsorships, whatever yeah. that is right now, they're equal. And it needs to be where like the added money and stuff that needs to be like way up here. That's what you were supposed to do for disc golf. Come on. Well, here's the thing. You get speed bumps a lot of times. Unfortunately, <laughs> I also heard disc golf, like was the nicest people ever. And it's like, if you don't, they're very nice to you until you disagree with them. And then they hate you. Someone um, told you disc, a bunch of disc golfers were nice. I'm <laughs> yeah. It, my, it's, my, my career, the average tournament was 500 bucks a tournament. That's how much I won over my whole career. Like that you just did the math on that. You're saying, yeah, I did it a while back. It was like five. I averaged like 500 bucks a, a tournament. That's I think we very, should give it. This is very, my opinion. Much. And I'll, I'll pay for it for one week. I, all those disc golfers that are going to comment on here, but like, well, you guys are complaining. I'd love to do that. I want to Venmo them $500 and tell them to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> for the week and see how they feel about it and you go to work every day, but you don't get paid. You just get your 500 bucks still. Cause it's not like you and I or us all haven't went there and practiced our butt off every day, showed up in the hundred degree heat in the pouring rain and tried our best. And you average 500 bucks for a week of work that I don't think anybody, honestly, we love disc golf and that doesn't change to me. I'd love disc golf. I'm going to play next year. Like I not saying this is like a hate retirement speech, but I'm saying this is like, I don't think a normal person realizes that like you're one of the most recognizable people in our sport and you average $500 per week of work. And yeah. that's a choice. If I start yeah. a cabinet company, that doesn't mean that I get to make a million dollars a year because I started my own cabinet. I mean, we have a choice to like, play disc golf, but you've dedicated your life and breath, soul into disc golf. And like at the end of it, you know, you're getting the, your return on your investment slash uh, time per week, per hour, you know, it is a questionable return. And I, I'm obviously, I mean, Brody and I don't keep in that close of touch, but I'm sure that's part of what is maybe gotten you out of disc golf more is maybe, you know, sports cards doing, you know, I'm sure whatever streaming site no, you're it's on never, is. It's never a financial thing, right? Like I, I've always told people, if it was a financial thing, I would never have stopped doing Frisbee trick shots. I would never have stopped doing golf. But at um, some point it, it, I mean, no one wants to lose money every single day for their whole life. Like I'm not saying that you <laughs> did. Your whole, I li that's, saying, what like, I, that's literally what I do every day. <laughs> it's called it's called having a wife brother <laughs> yeah uh, i lose i lose money every day brother <laughs> but i'm just like on my point I, I wasn't meaning to come across as like rude to your whatever i was just saying like at some point if you were making a uh, million dollars a day it might be easier to be like oh man i'm really gonna keep a little grinding nicer. on this disc golf thing you know, like, and that's just my, like anybody, I don't care if you told me, Hey, I have to go outside in my front yard and stand in a trash can and bang my head with the drum set, but I'm going to make a million dollars a day. You, you I'll do, do it. Yeah. You do get to the point though. Just like being upfront, like every, you know, there was a point in time where I could go out, uh, spend a day to two days filming a Frisbee trick shot video. And that video would go anywhere, depending on sponsorships, anything like that. That would make me anywhere from like fifteen to a hundred thousand dollars. But there comes a point in time. Can I? I think I'm pretty good at trick shots. What about you? <laughs> there, there becomes a point in time <laughs> where money doesn't really do it for you, and it's never really done it for me. Hence, why I started doing frisbee in the first place. Like, yeah, uh, you, you don't really. I wasn't really making a lot of money. Uh, when I first started, but I loved what I did. And so that's why like getting into disc golf, it was never about the money. I loved playing disc golf. I loved competing. I loved trying to learn how to play. Now there's other factors that go into it where I'm just like, man, I don't really see the growth. I don't see things changing. I don't see things going the right way. Um, obviously too, like it's not super fun when you're giving a lot of time and effort into something and you just have a bunch of people trashing you all the time. Like it's not, it doesn't really make you feel that great. Uh, so there's other factors than me. I get what you're saying, but like I'm just in a spot right now where like money doesn't incentivize me to yeah. do something, but you just... it a hundred percent does for a lot of people that uh, are early in their career or maybe money is something that is very, in, um, it, it definitely incentivizes a lot of people 
Money yeah, just no, never I mean, I was agree. something just, that incentivized me. You just spoke something that hit me right in my soul is that, you know, you put your heart and soul and time into something and just feel like you get crapped on. And granted, I've brought a lot of it upon myself with my hot takes or my comments at times, but I've definitely felt that way about disc golf for a long time is that I feel like the grand scheme of things, I've never actually hurt anybody or actually done malicious things to people. And I feel like I get a lot of uh, smoke, I guess you could say, from people. And I feel like I've given as much or more than I've taken from the sport. And so I feel where you're coming from in that standpoint of, you know, feeling like you're putting products out there or yourself out there and, and getting, um, I, know, I guess, minimal uh, self return, I guess, if that's uh, the correct term, but I definitely feel you on that one. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's at the end of the day too. It's just one of those things of where right now disc golf is in a very, um, it's a very interesting spot, right? Because there was just not a lot of media around disc golf. There just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of people talking about it. And now it's one of those where it's like, if you're not the best, if you're a touring pro and you're not the best player in the world, your opinion doesn't matter. It's what a lot of people have. And to me, it's just like, I don't, for a sport to really blossom and to really grow, you need to have people excited about it. You need to have people excited to debate about it and talk about it. You go on any forum and you'll see fans go crazy back and forth. Yeah, we're lagging super bad right now. I don't know what's happening. Sorry, I will try not to move. Um, but any any sport, when there's passion, people go and, and go crazy. And that's the thing is like, when you show that passion in disc golf, even people, I would love to hear what Ricky said afterwards because I don't, I, do you guys, do either one of you know what he said after? I, I watched it. Okay, I, we'll, we'll talk about that right after this. But even when you show passion in, in like playing disc golf, people like there's people that are like, that guy sucks. I hate that. And it's just, it's, it's growing pains right now. There's, there's a, a lot of growing pains that disc golf is having to go through right now. And uh, it's, it's very interesting to see where it goes because it has a potential. And again, it's at the end of the day, Disc golf is never going to change for the majority of people that play disc golf. We on this podcast, pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time, we're talking about the professional game. If you love disc golf and you hate the pros or you hate certain, don't watch this podcast. This podcast is about the professional game. And that's where I think the line draws is everyone wants to be lumped in the same group and be all part of the same community. And if you look at other sports, there are multiple communities. There are people that like to just play beer league in softball. There are people that like to play semi-competitive. There's people that like to play competitive. There's people that like to play in the, there's so many different levels. And I think disc golf right now, and Yuli, tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think people wanted to grow out of that grassroots where everyone was together. And I think that's a lot of times what we're seeing the pushback is I'm saying we need to create multiple communities where everyone feels welcome in their community. And everyone's like, no, it needs to be this one community. And if you're trying to break that up, get the flip out. Yeah, I think there are two separate things. I think the professional side, completely different from the recreational side. You can still have that sense of community. You can have your local clubs. You can do your beer leagues. You can go out, play doubles on the weekend, play with your buddies, play with three discs and a beer, and it's fun, right? But when you're talking about, I think you're right, Brody, when you're talking about the top, uh, tippity top, which we do on this podcast, people get offended because they, they don't live it. They don't know it. I come from a place where I could have never, well, I, I could say I imagined it getting here to this point, but I still haven't imagined it getting past this point. Right. Yeah. Like th this is like, as far as I thought it would ever go, I, I believed in my heart when I was young, like, Oh man, maybe somebody could make a hundred thousand dollars a year, $200,000. That was a million bucks to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's gotten to a place where we can have good careers if you really do it the right way is incredible to me. But for me, I always want to see this golf get bigger, grow bigger, as good as it possibly can do. And that's why I give everything. Just like you guys, I give everything. 
I'm a, I'm doing a podcast at uh you know what time is it now nine thirty at night got a wife and a little baby upstairs yep. but I give everything because I want it to grow. I I think that what Brody said is, and I, and I think that Yuli, you can I love your opinion on this. That's why we're here. Um, I think early in my career I was much more fiery, much more upset. You know, I've kicked my bag. I've done that stuff, and I think that quickly in my early career i got labeled as you know uh overly passionate might be a kind way to say it, a pc way to say it and i think that sadly that's just like kind of stuck with me um you know i think that the you know and i think that that's like what you're talking about with the community you know is it's like if that's not how you play at league you now hate that person i mean you see it with nico and I, i'm not at all comparing myself to nico but you know it's the same thing he gets on league card and it, the comments are just oh he sucks he's slow he's this it's he's, he's like that's one of the best people to ever play our sport like whether you like him you hate him you think he's slow you think he's fast you think he's annoying it's like at the end of the day he's an athlete he's a competitor and he's one of the best you've ever had and now is he you know, has he won USCDC, what, 11 years ago? Sure. But, like, at the end of the day, like, if you're a fan of the sport and you like disc golf, then he, there there's has to be some, like, respect paid, I feel like. And I think that's what we're missing from, like, our fan base, in my opinion. It's just like Ganon. Oh, Ganon's slow. Ganon's this. It's like, why can't we just, like, appreciate what we're watching to a certain extent? And I'm not saying you have to like everybody. I'm not saying you have to like me. You have to like Brody. You have to like – I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, like, at a certain point, I think there's some – respect level to being a fan of like, you might hate Tom Brady, but if you say he's a shitty quarterback, then you just aren't a fan of a fan of sports. Like you're, you can't just be like, Oh, Tyreek Hill's horrible. And be like, Oh, I love football. It's like, no, you can not like the guy because of whatever he did or didn't do or got arrested or whatever. But like you talking about somebody's game and that them separate from their personality is like what needs to be done. I think for disc golf fans to like be able to unite in my opinion, cause like Brody, you and I, we've had our back and forth. I still have enough respect for you when you text and say, Hey, do you want to come on? Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I don't, there's no bad blood from my end between you and I, and we can have our little spats. That's, that's life. That's sports. That's being a colleague or whatever. I mean, not everyone's going to get along or see eye to eye every single step of the way, but I have enough respect for you and Paul where, I'm happy to be here. I'd love to be here every week. I, you know, it's, this is fun to me, but I think that we're lacking like as a disc golf whole of being, being, I guess, cooler to people that you don't quite think are the bees knees. If that makes any sense, Paul, what do you think about that being here for? I think years? it's sports. I think it's sports in general. And, and the bigger we get, the more people are going to not like you. I think that that just comes with the territory. Like I look at football every single weekend. And if you're on my fantasy team and you're not playing good, I'm saying to the TV that you suck. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that that sports in general. Now, do I really think that about the guy? No, but the guy got me 0.2 points and I lost my fantasy <laughs> league by four guy's points. Trash. Like that guy stinks. He's trash. He's going on the waiver wire, you know? And uh, I think what you're saying is, is a little bit more personal because it's such a tight knit community that you see the comments and you're like, wait, I know that guy. You know what I mean? Like I know I actually, he's met me and that's a lie type thing. You know yeah, what no, I mean? I think, that, I think that that's, I think you're correct. It's like, I'll see even just like, I know Brody has had to like other pro someone post something and you're like, man, that's kind of rude. Or that's just simply not the truth. And then there's four like pro tour players that like it. And you're like, Whoa, like what? <laughs> you're like, what did I do to you? You know, you're like, what do you yeah. like? That's obviously not the truth. That's like someone from their account and they have four friends and their profile pictures, a cat. And now it's like, these people are like jumping on this bandwagon. And like you said, I think it become, it's just like, if I said something about you, Paul versus someone else saying something, yeah. You'll call me or text me, like, hey man, what the heck? Where if some, you know, chucker from Illinois says something to you yep. or about you, even if it's the same exact words, you're like, ah, whatever. I think that the personal side of the things is where, you know, we as disc golf could help separating these things, if that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think where where we want the sport to go, right? We're looking at other sports. We want the we want the money, we want the fans, we want the uh, exposure. We, that's what a lot of people want the sport to go. Right. Um, and when I talk about the sport, I'm talking about the disc golf pro tour. I'm talking about the pro scene with that comes negative stuff. 
it just, it is what it is, you know, and we don't even have right now, we don't even have people betting against us. That's really like what Yuli was talking about. Like, that's really where someone might send you a DM to, you might lose their house. Yeah. Or say like, <laughs> I, if I see your kids out, but you know, they, they're going to say really nasty stuff. Um, right now we don't even have teams. Like that's the other thing. Like there really isn't, uh, if people, do, if someone doesn't like you right now on the pro tour, uh, they just don't like something about you personally because there is no connection. Uh, no one has any connection towards me versus if I went to a team that that person was a fan of for years and I start playing bad and losing the team. Now, now all those people hate me because they're like, dude, you suck. You're making us lose. I, th- whether I win or lose has no impact on anyone. And so it's literally just whether they like you personally or not. Do they like yeah. what they, how you play? Do they like what you say? And at the end of the day, you can't really fault someone for that. And we also need more people. And this is where I think at the end of the day is like, you just need more people sharing their opinions and, and being open to talking about it. And so like, that's where, with me, like we create a show for people to call in and debate night and all that stuff. I, I just don't see that getting any better as the sport grows. It's only yeah. going to get worse. I and you just have to deal agree. with it. You got to be yeah. ready for it. What'd you say, Yuli? No, I agree. I agree with oh. you. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, let's change a little, let's change a little bit and go something else. This was actually an interesting post. Uh, before we let you go, Drew, I kind of want to roll through this because you are someone that's not afraid to say what you're thinking, which, you know, at the end of the day, you got to respect for someone, whether you agree or not, to at least say what's on their mind. We need more people to actually step up and do that. Um, so this was a post uh, by the Disc Golf Fanatic page over on their Facebook. They said, if you had one recommendation slash tip for the Disc Golf Pro Tour, what would it be? And I want to respond. I want to give you guys some of the comments and then hear what you guys think. So the first comment I pulled out was, let the low entry divisions do more creative things to keep growing the sport. When TDs won't give women our layout, we just start playing in women only tournaments and local tournaments, get less of our support, educate. So this was a little bit of an interesting one. What was the original, what does it say? At let the, top? the low entry divisions no, do No, 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 more- the original post, what is, what is the topic, oh. sorry. If you could just give the disc golf pro tour a recommendation or tip. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, So it's let the low entry divisions do more creative things to keep growing the sport, which I kind of agree with. I like that. Um, But then I'm confused with this one. When TDs won't give women our layout, we just start playing in women only tournaments and local tournaments get less of our support educate. So I think they're saying like, I think this is a female. I think she- I think that what they're trying to convey is that if they sign up for just say the local Dallas Open B tier and they have to play the same tees and baskets as the men, they're more likely not to play and support that event and go play another event versus if that TD at the Dallas Open were to give them an FPO layout with shorter tees or shorter baskets or both, that they would be happy to support both events. But I don't know what that has anything to do with the Pro yeah. Tour because the Pro Tour every single week has 18 pretty much different p- pins or tees for the basket. Like I think, for the women. Yeah, I think this also just kind of shows like there are just a lot of people that have opinions or think they have opinions and they don't really know the ins and outs. And so maybe it's not always the best. Um, one, one of those being like the format. Didn't everyone didn't everyone hate the previous format? Where they reset. Yeah, for the most part, there was a lot of negative like there was a lot of people saying it, yeah. that it was so stupid. And then this time now we're seeing everyone say well, no one's going to beat Gannon. He's starting with 10 shots. And then I know when like um, uh, Nathan Queen won, when they did the pools, everyone was saying when that happened, like, well, this is so stupid. Nathan Queen won because of everything. Everyone's going to find something to disagree with. Uh, There will, well, not everyone, sorry. There will always be someone out there that disagrees. We just need to come up with stuff that's the most entertaining to the masses. That's basically what we got. Because there's always going to be someone that skips it. As the guy that got second to Nathan Queen, I think it's a cool story. 
I, I think him, you know, going through, I think he obviously played the most rounds of anybody. And then taking down myself, Hamas, and Macbeth in that final round. Like, obviously, I would have loved to win, but I think that that makes for the story. I think now, I mean, let's be real. Whoever got in at 32nd place, they have zero, they do have 0% chance of yes. beating Gannon. And but, as they, but and in my opinion, be. as they should, yeah. you know, I mean, Gannon earned that throughout every single event and every single week. But I do think there's there's got to be some way to have a happy medium between these two. Well, if we because, like the playoff, turn turn one of these events into that playoff format. Yeah, I, like I think we, there's just we, something. If we, if we like that, it, just do that. Yeah, I think there's got to be something that's in between because I do think that it's a little BS. Like one of the rounds Yuli caddied for me at that Pro Tour Championship, I lost. I think what probably shot like ten or eleven under at Hornet's Nest, and then the next day I was just even par again. I think I shot the hot round by like three or four strokes, and it's like, I you know I lost by one or two. It's like you know I would love to have those strokes that I earned. But have, I go ahead. Have the have the Pro Tour be like this. The points and everything is just a straight payout. So you get, if you win the pro tour championship, it's a bonus $30,000 for being the points champion. And then everybody who qualifies, just throw another tournament together. Yeah. I mean, like that? I said, I, I do agree. Cause when I looked at it and I, I don't remember, I think it was like Jesse Niemann. I hope I'm saying his name yep. right. Yes. He, he, uh, you know, he got in because he won a pro tour event in Europe, whatever. And he was at the very bottom of the list at even par and get gain and sent under. And I'm like, this guy has negative 20% chance of winning the tournament. Like to him, it almost feels like I, I would assume like you're out there just because you're getting paid, you know, some lump sum of money in order. Well, he could finish, what, he could finish in, you know, six or seventh or eighth. If he played really well. Yeah. I mean, again, I just feel like there has to be some type of like, mm, medium here in my and like i said i'd love to hear you guys' thoughts like i i just think there needs to be more something just, that's a little bit more rewarding to the top people but a little less punishing to the bottom people he er, he earns it like like if tiger woods in his heyday got 10 shots going in the fedex cup like nobody's catching him you know what i mean that's just the way that it, i mean yeah. what happened this year with uh scotty scheffler yeah Did it's he just win? the way the format's set up I, I don't think disc don't golf. Know. Did or, Scotty Scheffler win? I don't. I wasn't paying attention, but I. I don't. <laughs> I just don't I think, think it's good in golf. I don't think people like it in golf. I don't, and I don't think I don't people. Like it. I don't think people like it in disc golf either. Like the the way that disc golf is set. This goes back to that was all created for FedEx. They wanted something. To me, just do away with it. If we like the old format, then just have an event during the season where it's like the top thirty two get in and have that fun event that they had that Nathan queen ended up winning, have that fun event, just be a standalone. And then if the disc golf pro tour wants to have something, create something and try to make it a major, create an event and try to make it huge. Uh, the playoffs make no sense. Uh, it just doesn't make sense in disc golf. It doesn't make sense in a, in a single player sport, the way that we have it set up. And so they're just trying to, this was 100% something they see golf do, and they're trying to copycat it. And it's like one of the worst things in golf. No one likes it in golf, and we're call, copycatting it. Why is this it. the thing? The only thing in golf we're willing to copy is their FedEx Cup system. system. Correct. Correct. That that's that's the big thing. It Drew, doesn't make my, any sense. My idea is this: you have the season-long points race. You get rid of the World Championship. You call the season long points race, the world championship, since you're traveling across the world, playing at all these tournaments. If you win that you're the world champion. And then you have the final tournament, just be the final tournament. Like it's the playoff. It's the championship. You've earned your right to be there and you throw a bunch of money in there and then you, and then you go on your way. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. There's a I lot mean, of things. There's a lot of things they can do differently. It's, it, it does blow my mind that this is the one thing that they really grab from golf and they're like trying to make work. Cause it, to me, it's just like a no brainer. Like it just doesn't work, especially at the end of the season. No one cares. USDGC just happened. It's luckily we did get a nice battle between Ricky and Gannon, but for the most part, no one really cares. It just, it just, no, it's not a big event that people are like, I have to tune in. I have to be here and watch this. You ask the top golfers. And I think, cause this is a lot of money. You ask the top golfers in the world. Would you rather win the masters or the FedEx points? Masters, the masters they are picking the masters. The only people that are picking the FedEx are the people that need the money that don't have the yeah. money. All the guys that already have millions of dollars. They're again, a major, it doesn't. Yes. They don't. They want, they 
They want legacy. They mm-hmm. want something that they can they can go down and be remembered for. Make no one's the, remember how many the final FedEx tournament. Won. A major, get rid of the worlds, make that the world championships. Not a, it's not a major, and you can be the world champion, and you can put it on all your discs, and okay. your 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 uh, team can sell them all. Yeah, the world champ. Size, can you find this clip and and tell me when you have it? Because I've seen multiple people say it now. I have not listened to it. Um, Aquarian, thank the Aquarian. Thank you for the five dollars. He just says, "Go look up the post tourney interview with Ricky. Made me like him less." There's been a lot of people saying they do not like he, what Ricky said. And, said he was pissed. And so, can I, you? I mean, I can kind of paraphrase it well, if Silas we can't can find have, it. Silas will be able to find it, and just let me know when you have it, Silas, and we can play it so we can all hear it. Uh, let me rattle these off real quick. Um, let me cut me off if any of these you guys want to jump in. So here's to make courses harder. It's not always about huge distance at every hole. I think we can all agree. I think that's actually a probably a good one. Uh, make, make disc golf free to watch again. That was another suggestion. Any rebuttals to that? You guys like that? Free disc free golf? Free it up. Free it up. All right. Keep disc golf in the woods and move away from open bomber courses. I'd love that. I think it does limit disc golf a little bit doing it. Yeah, you got to um, have both. And it's, it's, it's so much harder to make a good watchable woods course than it is a good watchable open course. But I get it. People don't like, again, it's just, some people are going to like the open. Some people are going to like the woods. It's tough. Um, let's see here. Last one, pay the players more without them. You have nothing to film. Uh, so Hands are, to that must be with what player. money with what <laughs> money with what money um size how are we doing on the potential My opinion well looking- i don't have a disc golf pro whatever subscription so it, i i'm not going to have access to it was it not on jomez or anything yuli did no. they have played at the end of jomez Mm-mm. oh so it's just at the end of the okay all right but, so yeah. but drew can tell just- you Drew yeah, can tell ahead. you what. Go ahead what and paraphrase. Say. He pretty much just the, Jeff's bringing him the the mic, and he said, "You know, this is really frustrating. Like, the uh, Gannon played great, and pretty much, like that's what I gathered. It was like a two, three sentence thing. He pretty much just said, this is frustrating. Like, he's pretty much pissed. Um, you know, you hope to come into an event like this where you have a six or stroke lead or whatever, and finish the deal. Uh, Gannon played great, and handed the thing back. Oh, so it wasn't like an interview. It was like a like a speech, speech, yeah, speech. Yeah, he, come up and he, speak. Like, Jeff Spring was probably hoping for a speech and Ricky, you know, was there to oh, fulfill yeah. his contract obligations. And he did it. <laughs> I, I saw the tweets about, you know, how are oh, people Ricky, getting Ricky, upset Ricky, about I, that? I went and looked it up and I watched it and I literally laughed. I'm like, did Again, it's just one of those things. It's like the guy just lost a six stroke lead. And the day before he was raptor legging it in from 90 feet on the last hole. Like, of course, anyone is going to be upset. I mean, you could give a little kid that lead and let him lose it in nine holes. And he's not going to be happy. And, like, and this is also too, guys, again, we are talking now. Uh, I get, I get this kind of going to your point too, Drew, a little bit. There are going to be more people. Kristen Starr even talked about she had a putt for $8,000 on the final hole. The money at this tournament, and this is why I think like when you add money into things, it makes things really interesting. Ricky is not, I, I get it. Ricky does have a nice contract, whatever, but he is not 20 mil in the bank. Like some of these other professional athletes where if they get fined $50,000, $30,000, it's whatever. That, that money that he lost also adds to the fact of losing the tournament like that that is a thing it wasn't like it, it has to come into play for some of these guys i don't know ricky's Why probably a little throwing a mic to a guy who just took second that's a, ricky's ricky's a little bit more better off than a lot of these people but imagine imagine if that was someone that could have made winning that thirty thousand dollars that would have been as much money as they made all season. Imagine handing them the mic after Lim losing six shot lead, what they're going to give you, right? Like I get it. You have to give the mic to Ricky there. Cause you never know what you're going to get. Some of the interviews you get from these players right after a loss in the UFC March madness is some of the best stuff. Cause it's just raw emotion. And uh, Ricky gave it to you. That's what he gave to you. And you have to take uh, that- it. You can't get pissed off at the guy. Yeah, I mean, that, that again, that, like, goes to, like, you mentioned before you started that, like, 
you got the guy in like a very vulnerable moment. You know, he just, like you said, lost a couple thousand, ten thousand dollars, whatever it might be. Lost the tournament. I'm sure he went to bed the night before thinking, of, you know, he's a pretty confident guy. Got this locked up. You know, six stroke lead. You're playing great. And then you put a microphone and a camera in his face. And then you, there's people all over the place like, oh, well, he did this wrong. It's like there is no wrong thing. I mean, when I won Vegas, Terry Miller, his first thing was asking me about gaining. Not about the tournament, not about anything else. Like, oh, what do you think of Gannon? It's like, I didn't go on Twitter and say, oh, he did this wrong. He should have been asking me about me. Like, they gave me an opportunity to be gracious towards Gannon. Um, and, you know, I, I said he's going to be great, and I think I got lucky. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, like, I, those are the emotions and the times where you can't really fault somebody for saying something that you don't yeah. agree with because you're I'm asking so, somebody I'm so happy right now you know couldn't lose well, to a better guy if like, someone that's said what that, they were expecting yeah if someone said that like that is the disc golf answer that we expect yeah. because spoiler alert people disc golf people a lot of them are liars and a lot of them are fakes and a lot of them are wearing masks and it's not really who they are uh ricky again he's got a little bit of money now he doesn't feel like he has to give something that he's not. He's giving you the he's giving you his honest opinion of how he feels right at that moment. And you got to respect him for that. If he would have yeah. said, I'm so happy for Gannon. This is awesome. He would be lying to himself and be lying to all of us. So I don't know what you guys want for him. I don't know what you want him to say. I think what he said is completely fine. Yeah, I mean, I think you tell the truth and you're damned and you lie and you're damned. I'd rather go down for telling the truth personally. <laughs> Yeah, if he wanted to add in like a little bit of like, congrats to Gannon at the end. Like, well, that's what, what he said. He said Gannon he played great. Yeah, he, he did oh, that's that. fine. What the heck are we talking about? Yeah. What um, are we talking about? I was going to say, even if he didn't say that, it's fine. But if he would have added that in, that would have been like a nice touch. Well, that's what he said. He said, I'm pissed. I expected to hold, you know, a lead like this, you expect to hold on to. You know, very frustrating day. You know, Gannon, you played great and just pass the microphone oh, back. Then, well, yeah, this is a non story. Yeah. But, you know, again, this is okay. I like people are bringing this up. This is what disc golf needs. You need people to come with bad takes and you need people to come with good takes. The give and take. You need it. Give it. Um, all right, Drew, before we get you out of here, anything to promote? Anything coming up down the down the way to tell the people? Hey, wait, do we have his stuff or do we not get that done? Oh, I don't know. Size, do we have that stuff? Yeah. We've, been we've been struggling a little bit with the internet and stuff tonight. So we'll see if we can pull this up. Good call there, Yuli. Oh, there we oh, go. All right. Yeah. We got, we got Drew Gibson's Madden rankings here. All right. So we got your scoring at 83 power at 97 accuracy at 85 scramble at 79 putting at 83, I believe. Yes. And then overall at 85, anything jump out at you. I, what are other like what is Yuli rated here? I don't know if we've had Yuli pop up yet. But this uh, is this is based this is based off of uh touring professionals, so you have to play a certain amount. And the average, I believe, is 85. So you're pretty much your overall smack dag average, and then some of your statistics, power and uh accuracy. Accuracy is the average and then based power is off the charts. Too. Yeah, this is based on this season statistics. And again, oh, so then if, I, if they're calling me average, that's fantastic rating because I feel like I'm well below average at the moment. <laughs> we also had some people complain about uh, statistic taking because this obviously is going off of the statistics that people record. I think it was, oh. I think it was Ezra, the one that was saying like not all his stats are in there. So he thought his numbers should have been higher. Um, but yeah. I mean, 85, that's like what a B plus or something in school. Uh, I've never laughed at a B in my life. So I, I'm fine with that. One thing I did want to, Oh, I'll ask this and then I can do my little outro and say bye to all of your beautiful friends. But I wanted to ask what you guys thought about your, the tour card situation. Oh, like, I just want to know what, what Paul, what you guys think? Like, am I being, over sensitive because I pay my own stuff and I view that thousand bucks as like, okay, I want to get a return on this thousand dollars. Or do you guys also feel that it, it, I think that process could be a little um, more refined or better or not charging us at all for, uh, you know, whatever amenities that we might be claiming. I mean, parking's atrocious. Parking's really bad. Brad shreds those snacks. Not gonna lie, he probably gets a thawi a week in snacks. I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> hey, Gannon fills his bag with those things and says it's for the Airbnb. So <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, don't fault him. I, I, it it kind of goes back to when we were playing ultimate Frisbee and there was like entry fees to get into tournaments and players were complaining that there weren't like bagels and, bi- and and bananas and all this stuff at the course. And the TDs were basically like, if you want all that stuff, the entry fees have to go up. And then you'll complain about the entry fees being too high. So that's kind of where I'm at is like, if we want purses to go up, buy your own snacks. I, I, mean, that, I, that, I can buy my own snacks. That's that's if we can all buy our own snacks, because it, it, it's it's kind of like we're almost playing uh what is it credit card roulette right where everyone goes out and someone orders like a seven dollar hamburger and then there's like everyone else is ordering alcohol and ordering uh, dessert and they're like all right credit card roulette and you're like bro I mine's seven bucks I'm completely fine with just paying mine and all these other people are paying like thirty dollar tabs. It's kind of like what you're saying. Like some people are really utilizing these snacks and eating these snacks and maybe some of the other amenities, which I don't even know what really comes else with it other than parking. And if you're never using it, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Like I said, I'm it's just a curious thing for me. I, I, I like to base my opinions off of what I've experienced and like what I, I feel to be fat most of the time. Like I try not to be like in misinformational with my things. And so, I mean, there's two people on tour that have paid for the tour card. And I just am interested in what, what you guys feel that. And like you said, the parking is, is an atrocious shit situation so almost every single week. Um, you know, and like I said, I, I just am curious to just something that, you know, the opportunity to talk about this with two other touring people on a podcast. And I mean, I made that video about the USADC, like the money and all of that. And I got a lot of overwhelming comments. Of, wow. This is really cool. Like I like hearing about this side of the sport. So I think that us three sharing this is also something that people um, will enjoy and find value in because they don't get to know this type of stuff. They don't know. We probably pay a thousand bucks to have a parking. They don't really know that. So there's going to be people that are like, Oh, I didn't even know that you did that. You know? And it's like, also, I would be happy to pay my thousand bucks if like after you're around, you had like, you know, fresh cooked chicken sandwich or something, not just like 14 bags of Halloween size Skittles. It's like, I don't even want those Skittles. It, it, <laughs> it, like, it, we're going to be. It's again, one of those things where it just, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. Like that kind of, that kind of. It should just where, be there. I mean, who are we kidding ourselves? It should just be there. It should just be there. Like, who's wait, paying you, for it? You think that <laughs> who's paying for it? That's what I'm saying. Like, what? What do you mean? Who's paying for it? The tour. The the tour. The tour then should pay for it. But then that's coming out of the purse. Everything right now, the tour pays yeah, because for our purses is, are because we don't have any money in there. That, that's what I'm saying. Everything. Everything right now that is coming out. It, uh, uh, anything that the tour is paying for right now is coming out of the purse. If they, know, hire, if they hire a it's new just person different in other sports, because on the PGA tour, you're going to get a massage afterwards, a nice, uh, well, uh they some pay champagne for those people. and they have millions they, of dollars. The massage people they pay for, that's not tour provided, but tour does provide them a workout facility. They have, yeah, a, they have a traveling workout facility. They have probably a water snacks. on the courses. They have, yes. But again, it's different because if you cash at a tour event, you're making 40, 50, $60,000. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, no one really cares that they're spending a couple thousand bucks here and there. You know, they're not, they're not putting that stuff out there and being like, we have to take away from the purse. Right. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I right now our purses it. are small to where every little penny that gets spent elsewhere, people are going to be like, wait, why are we spending money on that? In my opinion, I think that players should park the closest to the warm-up area in hole one, period. Not the media crew, not what it, like, that's not, that LeBron James doesn't have to park across the street so that the NBC photographer can park in the front row. And I think that- That is backwards. Remember, media should be further away. I don't know why media is the best parking. That is backwards. Players are closest to the entry. Media is far away. At that, that's how every other sport does it. I don't know why disc golf is doing it back. So again, you're pay- we're paying a thousand dollars for a further parking spot because the media is more important than us, apparently. And then I would rather, I'd love for them to just have ice, pay for ice, water bottles if it's needed, and sunscreen. 
And if you want to bring us gummy bears or Skittles or vitamin water or whatever, go to the store on your way. Sunscreen's and also another thing. Like, I'm going to disagree. Sunscreen, you can buy. You can you buy your own sunscreen. Yeah. Like, if we're going to spend all this money on things, at least provide something that, like, it is a, a oh, useful. I see. I see. But if, I'm not. I don't want sun. I have my own sunscreen. I'm really saying if they're going to spend a thousand dollars, at least spend it on stuff that you're going to use, not stuff you're not going to use. Yeah, I'm saying like just for people, like people, if you're outside in 90 degree Nashville heat, you should probably throw on some sunscreen on your face. Like you don't need fucking. Excuse my language. You don't need Skittles with 90 dyes in it. And you know, like that's what that's my point. Is like yeah. if we're going to provide things for players, why don't we provide something that has value beyond just like some candy. And like I said, I have my own, I, everywhere I go, I have sunscreen. I'm not saying sunscreen for me. I'm just saying like, well, keep us hydrated and like stop us from maybe getting melanoma. I'm like, I wouldn't have any complaints. And I like, put the rest of the money into the, into the payout. I do like, I, that's, the, little, that's I do like the extra workout gear that they, they have there. Yeah. Like to stretch out and stuff. Well, that's, no, that's, I, that's also a one-time purchase, right? They yeah. have that. They, you, you don't need a charge for that anymore. You already have it, but I'm, I'm definitely in the, in the realm of like, everyone should be taking care of what they need to be taking care of. And the pro tour, the only thing that I should, as a player, when I show up, the only thing that I should feel like I am guaranteed is a parking spot and water on the course. Yeah. Those like, two uh, things, those two things, if they're, if they're there, I'm happy. And all this other extra stuff right now, it's really nice to have. I agree. But really at the end of the day, it's like, you probably should be putting that money back into the purse. Yeah. Until I would the person get up higher. to USCGC, not had to take a four minute drive down a one way gravel road to get to the parking lot and gotten 2,500 bucks. And I got 10th and no snacks at the warm up area that. I didn't even eat. There's that com- there's that comedian who who makes the joke about he was at a basketball game and uh, the guy's about to make a half court shot, so he asks his buddy like, "Hey, w- what does he win?" And he's like, "Tater tots for life." And he looked at his buddy and he's like, "I don't mean to brag, but I think I could have tater tots for the rest of my life <laughs> if I wanted." <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it, it will we'll be we'll see what happens again i think it is one of those things a lot of disc golf manufacturers yeah. kind of got kind of got fooled as well a lot of money was coming to the sport a lot of interest a lot of hype that's why the disc golf pro tour they hired a bunch of people that i don't think are essential i think right now the only people that disc golf pro tour should have under their salary is essential people like essential to make the tour go all the other additional stuff, I don't, I don't see it right now. It doesn't make sense until these purses. Again, you have to remember, guys, half of almost every purse is our money. And I know what I know what uh, I know what um, uh, I know what Drew said too is like, well, I'm paying for it. A lot of Drew, if sponsors weren't paying for your ter- tournament fees, guess where that money would be going in our pocket yeah it's still my like back in the day people would say hey whenever i would do brand deals and stuff i would always tell my agent to get me a stipend for travel right because all these companies what do they want to do they want to fly you out first class they want to put you in a suite they want to give you a car service they want to do all that for you so what do i want i want to do a stipend so they just say, okay, well, you have $5,000 for travel expenses. And you just get in the exit row. Yes, I just chill there. I take a nice little $75 hotel. I Uber or walk or bus or whatever, and I, I get to keep all that money. So that's the other thing is like that money, even though our sponsors are paying for it, that's really coming out of our pockets because that money would be going to us if they weren't paying for it. So. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, I just... I guess when, if I viewed my like invoice after Monday qualifying, it said 375 and I knew someone's writing me a check next Monday for it or PayPal, I wouldn't have even thought about, oh, wow, this is another expense. Yeah. But no. for me, it's literally, you know, I'm like signing into my PayPal, oh, business card, 400 out. I'm like, holy moly, like what? <laughs> but again, they, they keep raising it because the, the sponsors keep approving to pay. But what happens? Here's my question to you guys, Paul, you're obviously captain Discraft. What do you think happens when the entry fees become $500? 
And then these entry, and obviously, like you said, the the manufacturers are kind of probably looking around and going, "Wow, we, you know, got uh, I don't know if tricked is the right word, but you know, this isn't turning out the way we thought." And now the the payments are going down, the interviews are going up. At what point do the do the manufacturers tell everybody, "Hey, you're on your own"? Like that seven thousand dollar a year, ten thousand dollar a year cost is now in your pocket, and we're going to give you a forty percent pay cut. Well, eventually, when the sports as big as it, if it gets as big as we hope it gets, you're not going to have giant teams. You're going to have your top 10 people that get on coverage every week. And those are the only guys they have to worry about anyway. I mean, isn't that like typical? Mm -hmm. That's like in a real sport. Like that's what happens. Yeah. The problem, the problem is like, the problem is, you had a lot of manufacturers sponsoring a lot of players to help them on tour, to get people on tour, right? Oh, shout out to Ezra. He says, can't we just buy our own stuff? Yes, Ezra. Uh, he's in the chat right now. Very nice. But the problem is you had a lot of manufacturers helping a lot of people tour, right? Because they're like, we have to do our due diligence. There's a lot of people that these manufacturers were sponsoring that weren't making them any money. They were actually losing money sponsoring these people, right? But they were doing it because they knew they had to help out and get people out there. Now what happens is a lot of money starts coming in because of COVID and other things. A lot of money comes in. All these people want more money. The tour now, or the sponsors now are like, well, crap, do I have... So what we're seeing now is a shift of where before they were helping these people and now they're kind of like, we can't help you anymore, brother. And I just think it's, it's, it's some growing pains. It, it is what it is. It's a weird kind of flow of the sport, but that's where we earn right now. And that's, that's what it is. It's like, you're going to have companies look at it and be like, we sponsored 25 people, but three of these people make up 95% of our money. And the other, you know, 20 people, 25 people, they make up three, three, five percent, right? Why do we need all these people? Why do they need all those people? They probably don't. They probably don't. And that's what I've always said is like, I don't think a lot of these tournaments get worse if there's the 30 top guys are there. And then the guy like right now, you go to any tournament. Let's just say if you're not in the top 30, you're not allowed in the tournament. I don't think that tournament really changes all that much if those people that are in the tournament now are local, I don't think the tournament changes all that much from, from people watching it. Like the league card is going to be still the league card. You're not, we don't even, if you're watching it on coverage, you don't even see those people. Sure. You don't get like the crazy stories. Maybe you do actually, maybe you get like a crazy local guy playing well, but you're not going to have like, the crazy stories of like, this guy's been on tour and he's been finishing in 50th place. And he made, you're not going to get all that. Sure. But I'm still saying, by the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't change all that much. So why, yeah, I mean, why, so, why someone's would you get 10th in every tournament regardless? Why would you, someone, yeah. Why would you sponsor a guy that's getting 50th, 40th at every tournament? Dude, my sponsors might be watching. Don't talk about me like I'm, that. I'm just saying like, you have to bring something else to the table. So I don't know. Well, I could talk about that for a while, but uh, all right, Drew, hit them with the people. Where can they find you? What's going on? What are you selling? All that stuff. Uh, so for diaper money, I'm doing form reviews on my website. So gibsondiscoff.com. I'm doing video like form reviews with lines and all types of stuff that'll help you. If you go to our website, that will be at the very top. It says Drew's reviews. Um, that'll be a good way to support me and also help your form, help you throw better um, dial in a little bit. Um, but other than that, I want to thank you guys for being on here or, you know, hosting this and inviting me greatly appreciate it. Hopefully we could do it more. Um, and hopefully Brody one day when we retire, we can play 18 holes of golf together and maybe share an ice cream or something. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> we always appreciate you jumping on here. Yeah, brother. Thanks, Drew. yeah no worries. You guys have a good night.